That was just a very... Uh, okay. I think I'll take that sort of uh, announcement as, uh, as essentially the go-ahead for our session right now. I'm Jamila Bukwala. And call me Jamila, please. And um, I teach in the Department of Psychology. I'm a social psychologist by training, but I actually am a gerontologist by leaning. So I study the social aspects of getting older. And in particular, I look at our relationships and the roles they play um, in our health and in our challenges as we get older. So some of my research looks at family caregiving, for example, providing care to a spouse or a parent. Um, I also look at the role of um, marriage and the quality of the marriage in our health. What about marriage can help and what about it can hurt our health? And, and that, that's actually a tomorrow's session. But what I, I do want to say before we get started with the lecture, it's a little slide heavy, but I'm hoping that you will um, Feel free to raise questions. I ha you know, I'll leave some time at the end, too. But it would be great if we can have a dialogue. And, and I was telling Stan that I'm really um, expecting to learn as much as to share today. Because we have an entire spectrum, a very wide spectrum of ages here. We have uh, you know, um, alum who have graduated in the 50s and alum who have graduated two years ago. So we have a really nice spread. <coughs> And I will be honest, when I was developing my slides for this particular session, I was asking myself, OK, I normally teach 20-year-olds about successful aging. You know, <laughs> They're all in the same age group, and a very narrow age group at that. And so this is a, a somewhat of a challenge. But I'm hoping you'll feel free to share experiences or thoughts. A lot of my um, talk today will be based on some of the you know, research findings. but. There is always anecdotal information that can sort of really liven up um, a presentation. So I'm hoping you'll feel free to, to stop me and ask questions or share your own experiences or thoughts. And um, with that said, I want to start with a tiny exercise. So I'm going to have you pull out a, a sheet of paper, if you would, or you know, if you have a writing tablet. And I'm good to lower the lights at any moment when you. <laughs> Um, if you can dim them, can you dim them at all? Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. No one's falling asleep, right? Yeah. After a heavy so I want you to take a little <coughs> time to describe the characteristics or lifestyle of a typical 80-year-old person. The average 80-year-old person out there, what is your notion of their day-to-day life, uh, their characteristics, the type of person they may be. If you'll take a few minutes and just write something down. I find that difficult because a lot would depend on whether the, per the state of health of the person. So right. right. So if you were thinking of the typical person, would you, what would you think they would be like, even in terms of health? Well, we're in our 80s. Would you like us to get into it? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> But Doris, in a little bit, in a little bit, <laughs> I'll have you share that. I promise. <laughs> so if you'll think, just spend, you know, just a few thoughts. Stereotype. The typical. The typical, which would typically mean, yeah, the stereotype. So what is the average, if you were to, if you were to envision the average 80-year-old, what would you expect that person's life to be like or their characteristics? You know, what kind of traits or behaviors or thoughts or beliefs they may have? Well, I think a generation ago, it was different. Um, an 80-year-old is old. Yeah. Yes, but if we'll just hold that, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. You are, you're ahead of me, yeah. <laughs> so a couple more minutes.
Okay, and uh, I'm going to have you switch gears now. <coughs> and perhaps draw a line on that same sheet of paper. And now describe the characteristics or lifestyle you would expect for yourself when you're 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. if I may, um, I'd like to ask some of you to share what you have for the first part of the exercise. What did you write about the typical? <coughs> Do you find it? Uh, uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, someone who cares a lot about their medical problems and goes to a lot of doctors' appointments. Okay. <laughs> Amanda? Someone who doesn't want to lose their independence. Someone who doesn't want to lose their independence. Go ahead, Kelly. Gets much joy from your grandchildren. Gets a lot of joy from their grandchildren. Then. Forgetful. Forgetful. Female. Female. <laughs> uh, we, we do live long. Travel if you can. I said, you know, they may, in a typical day, be contacting family and friends, but they may have fewer age contemporaries. OK. So they may have fewer age contemporaries. Uh, time on their hands. Uh, they will have um, more time on their hands than they did when they were younger. Regimentation of whether it's eating, whether it's just things that are done at certain times that are more kind of so more regimented lifestyle, sort of more um, following a routine. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Thinking they would be calm. They would be more calm, <laughs> which is great. Uh, a quiet reading as opposed to TV. <laughs> um, so quiet reading, more quiet reading. Yes. Watching a lot of Jeopardy. Watching a lot, <laughs> watching a lot of a lot of Jeopardy. Uh, Amanda, we'll come back to you. Uh, nostalgic. nostalgic. Worries a lot more about the future and death, and even might become more religious. Uh huh. So worries a lot of that. That's that's a lot there, and worries a lot about the future and death, and perhaps uh, more religious. Sleep late. Sleep late. <laughs> what did you say? Watches a lot Sleep of TV. Late. Watches a lot of TV. Uh, less, Jeopardy less or not? Less politically correct. <laughs> <laughs> less politically correct. <laughs> narrower focus. A narrower focus. Okay. How about if we switch gears? Was your description for yourself very similar? <coughs> okay. So for those who found that it was discrepant, in what direction was that discrepancy typically? Yes. I'd say physically, right? Because I would like to be physically active. Okay, so you see yourself as more physically active. Okay. Healthy. Yeah. Healthy. Yeah. Experience always learning. <coughs> more. Classes, like it right here. <laughs> yeah. So so more curious, more um, interested in learning. Purpose to life. And and you mean a, a bigger purpose? purpose. Yes, a purposeful life. And never forget life's one big adventure. And you're just on the other end. Okay, so not forgetting that life is one big uh, adventure. Yes. I, I, I think y where you get less politically correct, but I think you also get a little more. I, I mean, I think I've gotten more feet of clay. I'm only 47, but certain fights don't seem worth fighting at 47 that did when I were younger, and I'm sure that yeah. continues. <laughs> you, you're less politically correct, but you're also more willing to yeah. kind of move right, on right. and forgive. Absolutely, and, yeah. absolutely. And, and actually, we, we don't get into it uh, today, but there are theories about how we actually change our way of thinking and making judgments and decisions as well as we get older. Joanne? Um, I said that I would be more active because I live in a retirement community, and I okay. thought of a person alone in their house instead. OK, so more active, yes. Uh, I, wisdom from experience, I think, would be. OK, wisdom from experience. <laughs> I don't know if that's not atypical. I mean, I'm not saying uh -huh. that that's necessary. But, but you did mention it for you, and did you mention it for the other typical person? Uh, no. <laughs> well, but, they should have. <laughs> <laughs> so um, do you, do you, would you like to share what you think is the point of the exercise? What do you think I was trying to demonstrate? I actually do this with my, with my classes every year. You were trying to say how you would be different as an 80-year-old 
uh, as compared to your typical, stereotypical 80 year old. Right. And that one is unfortunately <coughs> a little more negative than the other, right? We, yeah. our, our view of the typical <coughs> older adult tends to be more negative than we have for ourselves because we're not going to be typical, for heaven's sake. You know, we're, we're ahead of the curve. Right? But if, if we all think more negatively about the average typical older adult, that actually has problems, not only for us personally, but for our society. And I'll come back to this issue a few slides down. But I just want you to hold this in your, you know, in your minds that it's important to, to talk about aging and to change our view about aging, to see it as a more positive. You know, there are losses, sure, but there are a lot of gains, and to really focus on the positive. I think this is particularly the case, what you're saying, the baby boom generation, because as it's marched through life, it always thought it was special. It always created new ways. I think, I think old age is going to be uh, no different. Yes, I, and, and the baby boomers absolutely have redefined middle age. Right at, you know, prior to the baby boomers becoming middle-aged, um, you figured if you, you, if you were in your upper 30s, you were considered middle-aged, no more. Now, people are like in your 50s, you're probably seen 50s. as 50s. 50s. <laughs> I like that more. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, she Carolyn. She made uh, clear that in her book. Yes, and yes. She redefined middle age and old age. Exactly. So, and Gail Sheehy's work is old and still, you know, we talk about her, her work on passages, right, where she yes. talks about these different passages we go through. Uh, well, question, if you want to talk about it now, but what did your 20-year-old say was a description of an 80-year-old? It's, it's a great question. So what do the 20-year-olds say? It's actually fairly discrepant. It's more discrepant. And actually, as we all get older, and so chances are, if I were to actually look at each of your responses and get your age, those of us who are closer to 80 are going to have less of a discrepancy. Because you've lived it, and you're closer to that. And you know we, we don't see the average 80-year-old or our cohort as being sort of inactive or you know having vacant time or <coughs> lonely or any of that but the younger you are you tend to, it's so remote I, I always say this is my challenge when I teach 20 year olds to make aging relevant because it is relevant if, if even for a mundane issue like careers there are so many jobs related to gerontology and and you know geriatrics that I, I I do try very hard to get my students, first of all, to see it as relevant, and second, to not see it negatively, to sort of dispel some of the negative stereotypes. It also depends, too, on their, their family history. If it they, absolutely if they does. They live with a grandparent or they've taken care of a grandparent, that's a totally different picture. Yes, absolutely. And, and it, it has to do with contact. How much are you in contact with older adults? And the more you are in contact with especially healthy older adults, then you're going to have a more positive view. But um, thank you for, for uh, doing this, because I was hoping that you know, it would sort of set the stage to get you to see that it, it is important how we see older adults, whether, however close we are to what we deem as late life. But um, with that being said, I, I, I really want to focus on oh, successful aging. And um, there, there is really a movement within gerontology to promote the idea of aging successfully, that it really is not all bleak. And that's what I am, you know, my, my presentation today is going to focus on. So how do you really achieve this? And what is it? Um, stop me, as I said, as we go on. And I have a few quotes um, uh, along the way. You can see that Henry Ford, and, and this definitely applies to all of you, that anyone who stops learning is old whether they're 20 or 80. So the fact that you're here, you're aging uh, successfully. <laughs> and uh, we're always the same age inside, is what Gertrude Stein has said. And when we were having lunch, some of us were talking about, you know, I, within, I, I feel I'm 32. And I probably will always feel I'm 32, right? And, and so we don't necessarily think of ourselves as old. Maybe the physical appearance changes, but the you know, what we are inside, our emotions, our thoughts, and feelings are still fairly youthful. And, and that's an important thing to remember, too. <coughs> but what I'd like to do is sort of give you some backdrop. When I was um, a young girl, I studied in India, actually. I went to, uh, so someone asked me if I was a Lafayette alum. No, I'm not. I studied in India for, uh, got my bachelor's uh, education in India. And this was back in the 80s. And if you uh, talked about developmental psychology, People just assumed that you were really talking about 
conception through adolescence. And that nothing exciting happens after you, you, you leave your, your teens, which is a crazy notion. And fortunately, we all have come to terms with the fact that development is really lifelong. And that there are changes that we experience and we develop in ways that are interesting and unique through all the stages that we go through in life. So today, developmental psychology is a very sort of archaic notion. And we think about more lifespan psychology, that there's development, human development is not just about <coughs> adolescence and childhood and, and, and infancy. It's about what happens in young adulthood and middle age, adult, uh, middle, uh, middle age as well as late adulthood. But what I do want, oh, and, and before I go on, actually, I, do, I don't want you to f feel any pressure if you are about taking notes. I have some of, most of the slides here for you. And you can just sort of uh, use these and pen thoughts or questions that you may have. But lifespan psychology is really the scientific study, of course, of age-related inter-individual differences and intra-individual <coughs> change, by which we mean that <coughs> Development is not just determined by age. Yes, it's related to age. You're going to have certain experiences depending on, on the life stage you're at, your chronological age. So we all go through puberty at roughly the same time. And it lasts for about the same time, mercifully, not very long for all of us, right? And women will typically go through menopause at roughly the same time. So, we're, so it's age-related, but it's not necessarily determined. All your development is not determined by how old you are. It's related to how old you are. Intra-individual change talks about how an individual changes over their own lifetime. So how do they change? So the focus is on how the person changes within. So for example, does a person's personality change as the individual gets older? Were you always outgoing? Or did you start out fairly shy? And now, because of you know, your own experiences and your friends and your career, you're more outgoing? So looking at change within the individual and what may account for those changes. And then inter-individual changes is how do people, what makes them different? Why is it that some people can age really fairly, is fairly successfully and others less so? So what is it that makes us different? Why do some people do such a great job with it and others <coughs> less so? So those are sort of some of the areas within lifespan psychology. Really? Yeah. How do you define aging successfully? Uh, we're going to talk about that, I promise you. So, so we're, we're just about headed into that. And, and the field divides the whole lifespan into two very broad phases. You have the early phase, which is childhood and adolescence, which was typically seen as developmental psychology. And now we, we also look at la later age, which is the, f the focus of gerontology, which is young, middle, and late adulthood. The picture you see here is of Paul Baltus, who is really one of the founding figures in the whole area of gerontology. And he defined what lifespan development is all about. So what is it? What does it mean to develop over one's lifespan? What he said was there are certain features or characteristics to our human development over one's uh, lifetime. He, said he was really one of the first people to say that development over the lifespan has both gains and losses. It's not all about losses as we get older and all about gains when we are younger. It is really a matter of every life stage has both gains and losses. In childhood, there are losses. You lose your baby teeth. Um, you know, you get your permanent teeth. You can think of, of childhood that way. In late life, you have certain gains. You gain certain roles. For example, you become a grandparent that you cannot do uh, when you're uh, a young kid. But you, you also have losses, of course. You do lose uh, physical vitality for example, or you can use, uh, lose it. And so you have gains and losses that mark development. It's not all about gains <laughs> early in life and all about losses late in life. It's about having both at every life stage. And, and a really compelling notion is the idea that development is plastic. It's modifiable. We can change things. So you can retrain your brain. If you've, if you've forgotten how, a particular skill, you can relearn it. If you had an accident and you you're not able to use a, a particular part of your body, you can go through rehab and you can change that. 
You can learn a new skill even late in life. How many of you use the internet? That's a great example, <laughs> right? How many of you grew up with the internet? <laughs> Very few of us. But, but that's, it's, it's a great example of how we're all modifiable. We can learn it even late in life. He also said that development, how you develop or how I develop, has to do with the generation we belong to. So the baby boomers is a great example. That that's a generation that has defined a lot of these life stages or redefined a lot of these life stages. But the generation we belong to really will determine our development. So if you were, um, if you lived as an adult during the Great Depression or even currently, um, and you're having a lot of financial trouble and you're, you're having a hard time making your ends meet, that is going to impact you very differently than, say, a 10-year-old child, right? Because that, per that child is in a different generation. Or if you, all your retirement money is gone, that has an impact on you today. But if you're in your 30s and 40s and you have time left to rebuild your, your bank balance or your nest egg, then it won't affect you quite as hard. So it really has to do with what generation you belong to. Your development is a function of the generation you belong to. And then he also said that, of course, our development is about multiple forces affecting us. You know, we have, uh, we have our culture affecting us, our immediate environment. Did you grow up in rural America or urban America? That will have an impact on you. So there are lots of different causes or factors that can affect our development. And he went on. Baltus actually died um, two years ago. But he, but he really changed the whole landscape of gerontology and how we study gerontology. <coughs> but what he did say was that there are different kinds of influences that will bring about development in each of us. And I'm sure you can think about each of these as affecting your own development and uh, when you reflect on your own life. For one thing, he said, our development is a function of what happens to most people of a particular age. So I mentioned, for example, puberty or menopause or retirement. Most people retire in their 60s. That has to do with normative factors. That is, most people go through those factors, and they're related to how old they are. So these are related to chronological age. And typically, if you look at the research, we see that these influences come very early in life, so how old you are when you hit puberty, for example and much later in life. So for example, when you will retire, you know, when perhaps you will go through menopause. And there's a sort of a lull in the, uh, in the early adulthood years. There's not much depending on your age, per se. You have normative history-related influences, and we talked about this already. What generation do you belong to? OK, so uh, when 9-11 occurred, if you were a very young child, unless you were directly hit by that event, it has, may not have had as much impact on you. But if you were in your 20s and 30s, it had a huge impact on you. If people who were in their 70s and 80s at the time of 9-11, actually, when they did research, they found that they were coping better with the event than people who were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So it really depends on how old you are, even when a particular event occurs and how that's going to influence you and your development. And typically, you see most of the influence of such factors in early adulthood and in adolescence. And then finally, you have those <coughs> unique experiences, things that make you different, what, things that make you who you are and why you are different even from a sibling or from another member of your family. So what makes us unique? And typically, that influence is going to increase with time because you're going to have more and more unique experiences. And that's going to make you who you are. So this is just sort of giving you a backdrop on the field of gerontology and where this whole focus on successful aging comes in within the field of gerontology. So I'm going to have you do another little exercise for me. And in a way, I'm having you do exactly what was asked of me. So how would you define successful aging? What makes aging successful? I want you to come up with any thoughts that you have for what you would consider successful aging to consist of.
And while you're doing that, would you also think about some successful agers that you know or you may know of? Successful agers. People who you know or know of who fit this definition of successful agent. So what do you think it is, and who represents it? <coughs> so who would like to share with us? Yes. Remaining intellectually curious. So remaining intellectually curious. If I were to write here, would you be able to see from that side? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's write some of this. OK. You can just shoot. A sense of purpose. A sense of purpose. Being happy. Strong support, system. Strong support system. Having grandkids. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. as long as you can get okay. Back. That's the first. <laughs> active lifestyle. Okay, so active. I, I missed one. Independence. Independence. Okay. <coughs> Asking for needed help. Oh, you guys are great. I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> Financial security. Yeah. Financial security. Good health. Okay. Okay, so access to good <coughs> medical care. I'm spiritual fulfillment. Okay, spiritual fulfillment. <laughs> Did I hear someone accepting, say that? Accepting that you're getting older versus trying to fight it. Okay. Don't lose your sense of humor. Oh, no. Okay. Um, Maintain sense of humor. The sense of humor <laughs> and accepting self. self and aging, right? Just the fact. How about a hobby or a particular interest? In okay. So sense of purpose or having hobbies. Okay. Being engaged. Engaged. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Yes, so, so engage in community. I'm running out of space. You guys are great. Yes. The scientists try to generalize. <laughs> Successful aging is the process of adopt, adapting lifestyle to life constraints. <laughs> that is great. That, that should be in a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so this is. <laughs> so adapting lifestyle to life constraints. And what I, what I want to sh anyone had anything more? Yes. Having a sense of satisfaction for the life that you've lived up to that point. Okay, so sort of a satisfaction with life lived so far. Sort of actually, uh, psychologists refer to that um, as a sort of you know when you when you reflect back, uh, having Eric what Eric ego integrity, right? Uh, the, the idea that you have lived a life mm -hmm. of integrity and you are happy about yes. your life. But that could be a negative. Then you. Then you rust. Then you said, well, you know, I've done such and such and such, and then it continues. OK, so perhaps it would actually slow some people down, yes. because they feel, well, I've done everything yes. I had to do. Exactly. OK, so not to rest too much on your laurels. 
right? Just a little bit, <laughs> occasionally, <laughs> every morning maybe. List already. <laughs> <laughs> Learning a new life, a new skill. Uh, uh, being able to learn new skills and, and adapting, and again, once again, adapting, uh, you know, with, with, um, with new challenges or, or new technology or whatever it may be. So this is really great. I mean, and, and you'll see that sort of the, the scientific definition incorporates most of what you've talked about. But can you tell me who you know as successful agents? Yeah, Volca from uh, uh, in finance. Paul Volker, Volker Paul from Volker? Paul Volker from Paul Volker. finance. Okay. Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Amanda. <laughs> so Doris here, absolutely. On this campus, Cy Fleck was a good example. Yes, Cy Fleck, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. I, I think people that uh, take up either conducting orchestras like that or sculptors have chosen an occupation which helps in aging tremendously. That <coughs> I can't think of too many people like that who didn't really live a long, full life. OK. So it may even have to do with the professional yes, occupation yes, you choose. Yes. OK. Yeah. Look at all the lists. Keith Richards of Rolling Stones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a wild but successful, yeah. <laughs> Uh, John Paul Stevens of the Supreme Court. Yes, yes. John Paul Stevens. Uh, yeah, Sherry. Gene. 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 Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, so really what, what I'm hoping that you did was you thought about your definition and you try to fit um, who fit, you know, who, or, or try to find who fits that definition, right? And that, that was the point of this exercise, but it's also to really to show you that we all have some sense of what successful aging is. The important thing is how do we achieve it? And we'll talk about that as well. But let's see how two very prominent psychologists have defined um, successful aging. <laughs> Rowan Kahn, back in 1997, actually, said that there are three important components to successful aging. It's not just being healthy. That's not good enough. There's more to successful aging than just being healthy. And in fact, they even qualify being healthy. So you, it's not just about avoiding disease and disability. It's not about just not having an illness. It's actually being at low risk for an illness. So it's not just sort of having dodged a bullet for now, but really having low risk of heart disease, for example. It's not the fact that you haven't had a heart attack as yet. It's more an issue of not being at risk for having one. So, the, so they really w refined that definition of being physically healthy. And you've talked about this here. And you can see that the idea that you want to maintain high functioning in your later years. This is in terms of cognitive ability, how you think, how, how you, your memory works, how you make decisions how you solve problems, all of that is part of cognition or thinking, as well as physical functioning, being as active as you can be. And the more active you are, and if you have a low risk of disease, you're already 2 thirds of the way um, to being successful uh, as, an a as an aging individual. And finally, they talk about being engaged with your life or with those in your life. So with your community, with your family. We talked about grandkids. Len, you mentioned grandchildren, a very important part of that engagement. And, and some of you, I, I know I heard volunteering, you know, doing community work. That's all part of what they considered active engagement with one's life. So it's not about earning an income when you're in your 70s. That's not what they're talking about. They're really saying you want to be, use your time productively, and you want to engage with other people. They're really important in pointing out that our social relationships are very important to our health. Being connected with people. And 20 years ago, it was the norm to think of an older individual as a very lonely individual. Someone who is reclusive, you know, is not really it connected with the world around them or with the people around them. And no longer do we see that as the norm or even as a prescription 
for aging. So for successful aging, we have to have active social engagement in the community, with one's friends, with one's family. Of course, there is the reality of perhaps your friends losing friends. As you get very old, you may lose your friends to death. But the point is to remain connected with those who are around you, especially family, especially grandchildren. They actually distinguish between usual aging and successful aging. So they, they were really, they played an important role in saying, look, there is a good, typical, not good, but typical aging that people think about. And then there is the successful aging. And you'll see there's a little figure um, in your handout. Oh. Oh. One of the impediments of successful aging is being able to read a print on this document. <laughs> <laughs> I will admit, I tried not to burn too many trees. So I, I, I could have given you one slide on each sheet and then just felt miserable and you know, was concerned about the environment, which is an important part about being concerned about your community. <laughs> this, is, this is for the 20-year-old class? <laughs> no, they don't get any. They don't get any. They have to take notes. <laughs> Um, so here's what, what Rowan Kahn really did in terms of their model. They show us that there are three components to successful aging, and the intersection of the three is what makes us successful. And so if we are to age successfully, it's important that we not just have one of these three, or even two, but that we have all three elements in our lives. <coughs> And what they also did was they actually showed us that the, the possibility of being free from the risk of disease is really what suc being successful agers is all about, right? They, that's a big part of that. In fact, they do say, Rowan Khan do say, that if you're physically healthy, then you can have the other two. If you're not physically healthy, going back to this. this is, there's a reason why it's really at the, at the crown of their model. Because you cannot have either of these if you don't have the physical health. Exactly. So it's really the, the, the crowning glory of their model, if you will. Because you need that in order to, to really have the other two elements even be possibilities. And then to have those and really build those into your life is what is going to give you that that opportunity to age successfully. Uh, uh, yes, yes. But let's say you're getting on in years mm -hmm. and that disease or disability come on. Does that crumble everything else? Uh, it, so it, it, it does. And actually, the, the next slide will, there. yes, the next slide will show you that as you go in, if you look on, on the x axis at the bottom, you're looking at age. And as we get older, the possibility of being free from disease and disability. Okay. Definitely goes down, Stephen, right? Stephen Hawking did not let do that sort of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. But he's amazing. I, to be wheelchair bound <laughs> and to do what you do, I mean, that, but he is really, if you would think about him, he's off the scale, exactly. He's off the chart. He's, he's not even on that chart. And, and that, believe it or not, will be something we'll talk about. How can you actually age? successfully given that there will be losses. I mean, in his case, of course, the loss was lifelong. But what about the fact that as we get older, we are going to lose certain abilities, right? I mean, we can't fool ourselves into believing, oh, my body is doing just as well at 60 as it did at 20. But that's not true. So how do we deal with that and still age successfully? And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that as well. But, but I just wanted to point out that you have to have no disease and disability, and actually, ideally, n low risk of that to have the other two. Otherwise, the other two are not really going to be feasible. And, and going to, to your question, this idea about as we get older, you can see this, this curve here is much higher. So when, you know, when you're in your 20s, there's a large percentage of people who are free from any kind of risk of disease or disability. And as you get to 75, there's a very small percentage, right? Or as you get to closer to 100, it's almost non-existent. So, uh, so that it, that it, it does remain a challenge. There is no two ways 
about the fact that there is a change. This little band here represents the usual agers. These are people who are at risk, who may not necessarily be ill, but they are at risk for illness. And according to Rowan Kahn, those, these folks are not your successful agers because they're still at risk for developing disease and disability, especially if you think about the 50-year-olds who are in this group. They don't need to be there. But there's also been uh, research that I've read about is that they say that if you get up to about 80, 65, then you're, you decrease chances because you've passed that age when you get a lot of the cancers because you would have had them already. So then there's a 20-year span that you're likely to live that long. Uh, th that's true. Yeah, and actually, if you look at longevity, uh, so if you look at your predicted, the likelihood that you'll live to a certain age, right. that's the long success. <laughs> <laughs> right, the longer you live, really, the, the longer you are likely to continue living, if you will, right? Because you've avoided a lot of the mishaps and accidents that could have taken your life early on. So there, there's no denying that. But uh, we were talking about this at lunch. There is an issue in, in gerontology. We distinguish between lifespan and health span, right? Because right? you could live a very long life. You could live to 100, but you could be very ill and disabled. And is that really what we want to promote? No, we don't. We want to actually promote. That's putting a strain on our, our resources. And Absolutely. And, and also for the individual, that, that kind of existence cannot possibly be a fruitful happy, you know, beneficial existence. And so in some sense, what we're, what we're talking about is really how, how do you do that? You know, how do you get to that point of successful aging, given that, well, you know, as we get older, even in your, in your 70s, you are still at higher risk for developing certain cancers than you were at 50. So that risk doesn't go away. It's just that, yeah, if you've dodged a lot of bullets, then, uh, you know, the, then chances are you're going to, you're going to live longer. In fact, the whole notion of wisdom, right? For a long time, we believed, oh, you get older and you become wiser. There's now research from Paul Baltus's lab, actually, that suggests that it could actually be a lifelong issue. It's probably, you're probably living longer because you're wiser. <laughs> you're making the right choices, you know? <laughs> I, I mean, Keith Richards notwithstanding, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but uh, there's always exceptions to the rule, right? They're the ones who really blow your lecture because you can always come up with them. <laughs> but, but the truth is that, you know, I mean, Keith Richards is an oddity. I mean, most uh, people who would have lived that kind of lifestyle probably well, he, did not live. He had long genes in his family, so both his parents Right, but you could have genetic, uh, you know, sort of cushioning, but if you're doing drugs and, you know, crazy, wacko kind of living, you could have gotten in an accident yeah. much earlier. Yeah, those right, right, right. <laughs> okay, so any other thoughts or questions? Okay. So in any event, uh, you know, as we get older, of course, the chances of aging successfully do do diminish, and so it remains a challenge for all of us. So why, why tell people about it, right? Why do I spend a lot of my time in my aging course every fall telling people, telling youngsters about the positive aspects of aging, that successful aging is possible? There are dangers associated with not doing that. I, I actually feel compelled to do that. If I don't educate the youngsters, they're going to leave Lafayette not knowing that, that you know, it, aging has lots of benefits to it. One of the most important things is to tell them that when you're 70 or 80, life doesn't end. Absolutely. You're not old. Yes, yes. You are what you are. <coughs> exactly. So, so really, the, the, uh, the primary reason we need to do this is to, if we change how society views aging, we'll actually have a lot of benefits. And I want to talk, I'm going to share with you some research that is very, very interesting about what negative stereotypes can do, not just to society at large, but to people who are older, people who are actually older. And if they come to believe that, you know, I'm old and so all I need to do is sort of be reclusive and lonely and miserable, that has an impact on a lot of other aspects of their lives. So it can lead to ageism. 
right, where you're talking about biases against older individuals, where people do, you know, feel that older individuals have, you know, essentially have negative stereotypes about older individuals. They view them negatively. They view their capacity negatively. And this can be translated into behavior. So your thoughts about older adults can then lead you to behave in discriminatory ways toward older adults. It can influence how older adults think about themselves, which is really important, because it can also influence how older adults then begin to perform on certain tasks. And I'm going to show you some, some research. I have this really, like, really? Right? <laughs> can it have an impact? Yes, indeed, it can. There's some very important research that came out in the mid-'90s um, by Becca Levy, who is at Yale, or who was at Yale at the time. And what she did was she decided, I'm going to do a cross-cultural study on memory performance, so how people perform on a regular memory task, and their attitudes toward aging. So do, pe do people in certain cultures, for example, view aging differently? What is the norm here, do you think? Do you think Eastern cultures, for example, in fact, I'll tell you, she, she had people from China. These were all people with intact hearing. And then she had two other groups. She had hearing Americans. So these were people with unimpaired hearing. And then she had the deaf American <coughs> community represented in her study. These were individuals who, were, uh, uh, who, had, who had hearing impairment. So what she did was she said, I'm going to look at these three cultures. Why do you think she chose China? Any ideas? A, a, a large, uh, intact, uh, gen multi-generational family structure as opposed to uh, and less uh, fracturing of the family, I think. Right, right. And so you do have a lot of intergenerational contact. People live together in multiple generations. And in general, um, being older is not seen as a liability uh, in certain Eastern cultures. With the arrival of MTV, a lot of things are changing, unfortunately, <laughs> everywhere, even in India. But um, uh, you know, when I was growing up in India, you know, even as a, a young 20-year-old, there was no MTV. And, and now MTV arrived after I left uh, to come here for graduate school. And, and things are different, uh, definitely. But um, what she did was she decided she's going to look at Chinese. Uh, individuals, and she had young Chinese and older adult Chinese. She had the same age breakdown for the hearing American and for the deaf American. Why do you think she chose the, the hearing impaired American group? Why would she expect them to be different from the hearing, do you think? Well, because they have to work harder because of that uh, impingement on their... Okay. So, the, so they may have to work harder. What do you think about their attitudes toward aging? Do you think they'd be a little bit different? I, I think they might, since they've you know, sort of worked all their life to get through their day, that it wouldn't change as much. OK. So do you think they'd be less negative or more negative? I I'm talking about less. relative to hearing American. I, I'm just going to venture yeah, that they'd be less. And actually, she, that's what she proposed, that if you were to look at the hearing impaired community here, she, she, it was, she was not really focusing as much on how hard they've had to work to age well, but because she had younger people too. But she actually figured or proposed that they're not sort of, you know, receiving the full onslaught of the media. The right? They're not listening to all the crazy stuff that a lot of us listen to on a regular basis, on a daily basis, and we don't think twice about it. You know, the whole focus on how important it is to be young and that how aging is just bleak, right? They're, they're less exposed mm -hmm. to that because they're not listening to it. At least uh, that form of exposure is not there. And so she, she decided to look at these three different cultures, if you will, and she tested how age and culture are related to memory performance. So do young and old people vary in how they perform on a memory task? Do people from different cultures vary? But most importantly, do they actually work in combination? So if you were from a culture where you had a positive view about aging and you were older, would you do better than someone who came from a culture where there are more negative views about aging? And let's see what she found. 
Oh, uh, uh, this is really saying what I just said, that she looked at the relationship between attitude toward aging. Okay. Yes, yes. The, chi the Chinese people who, who were measured, was that in, in, in China? In China, in mainland China. So she actually had, she, she had data collected in China, China. yes. And, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the um, caveats that are related to her research. But let's just see what she did. And this slide is not in um, your set, but it just I wanted to give you some backdrop. In terms of memory, she had them do a series of memory tasks where she had them recall information immediately after it was presented and then after a five minute delay. OK, and that's a typical way to test memory. And she had three visual spatial tasks. So she, this was not verbal memory. And that's important to remember. Because remember, the people from China were not able to speak in English. And she wanted to make sure everything was standardized across the culture. So she actually used an arrangement of, of, of patterns of seven dots. And she would ask them to recall the patterns immediately and then after a delay. OK, so she's not using a list of words and asking people to remember the words, for example. But she's using visual spatial. Um, information. And then she also had them actually look at faces. And, and uh, they would be told that this individual had fallen and broken a hip or swims daily. And then after a delay, they had to, they looked at the picture and they had to come up with what that person did. So what was that activity associated with the person? So again, a memory task, but related to facial recognition. And the reason she used facial recognition is because among all kinds of um, memory tasks, facial recognition actually stays pretty good well into our late life. It doesn't show as much decline as, say, verbal memory, our ability to remember. If I read a random list of 30 words out to you and asked you after five minutes to recall them, that's a much tougher task than if I showed you pictures. And maybe uh, you know some information associated with those pictures, chances are you would do better. And it's true, really, uh, fairly universally. And then she measured attitudes toward aging. She, asked, she gave them a facts about aging quiz. And she asked them, you know, how much did they know about aging? And they, she also asked them to come up with, pretty much like I did earlier, come up with five words or descriptions about the typical older adult. And then those were coded as positive, negative, or neutral. Now, what did she find? Oh, I have no idea why that's doing that. But here's what she found. In terms of. Now, attitudes toward aging. The only finding that was significant in her research was that the hearing Chinese, the, the, the folks in China, had more positive attitudes toward hearing than the American hearing. And the American deaf were more positive than the American hearing. Do you think that's important for her research? Mm -hmm. It is, because otherwise, she, she really couldn't proceed. Right, Because this shows that there is a cultural difference, and that culture seems to matter. So, so hearing impaired Americans were act, had a more positive view about aging than their hearing peers. And the Chinese individuals had more positive um, attitudes toward aging. And so that's important, because that's really what she had proposed. And that's exactly what she found. In terms of memory now, she found some really interesting findings. First of all, um, she found that the, um, the Chinese hearing, and the, she found an effect for culture. In other words, now if you look at this graph, the negative uh, scores are worse. The positive scores, so higher scores and more positive scores are better memory performance. And what she found was that if you look at um, the hearing Chinese, they were all in the positive range, whether they were young or old. My little purple square has disappeared. But the purple is the older adults in the three cultures. So what she found was that the Chinese hearing were really much better than the other two groups. And these two groups were being pulled down by which groups? The older adults. And so what she found, and she, this was actually very, very revolutionary findings, because she, she found that if you look at the hearing Americans, look at how low the older adults were doing on a, on a memory task that was universal to, to all three groups. Now, the young adults were doing well, of course, in these two groups. But the older adults were really showing a much lower performance on memory than their Chinese counterparts. 
And so she took her research to say, look, how we view aging matters. We will actually perform differently depending on how we view aging. She's actually subsequently done work that was published a couple years ago where she's found that your views about aging are related to mortality. If you have a positive view about aging, you live longer. I mean, it's fascinating that you would actually live after you control for everything under the sun. You control for people's health and, and financial security and everything else. They live longer if they have a more positive view about aging. So it's very compelling stuff. You can't get more objective data than death, right? Uh, I mean, that's, that's as powerful as you can get. Well, positive mental attitude keeps everything healthy. But the ones that are on the minus, the hearing and, and the deaf old adults. Older adults. adults uh -huh. um, wouldn't it maybe be less of the minus but still lower than the young because of age? Because I, I think as you do get older, your memory is not as good as young. Oh, and they did find that, that the young perform better. The young are the white oh, bars. Yes. So the young perform better than the older adults across the board, absolutely. But even if, but po possibly these uh, American uh, uh, older, um, older adults could have performed um, much better. I mean, it looks very much like they didn't do well uh -huh. uh, for, for the for the grant, but couldn't it uh, have been a little closer? Um, and, and maybe she would have thought it didn't really, it would have worked out for her. I mean, it, it seems extreme that it worked out for her, but would it work, have worked out if maybe the uh, hearing older Americans had been low on the positive, but less oh. on the younger? You, I mean, that's something that we don't know. We don't know what the data would show. Uh, one thing I should point out is that, the, you know, st what may look different statistically may not be different. But this was a statistically significant finding. In other words, it was, a, at least statistically speaking, a real difference. What I'm trying to say is, uh, couldn't it have been um, uh, more a function of the age rather than their attitudes? If you're saying, oh, it's their attitudes. Uh, no, it could, but w one thing I should point out, what is compelling about her research is that for the younger adults, look at the three groups. They're more or less the same, right? So it didn't matter whether you came from China or you were from the deaf American community or from the hearing American <coughs> community. Yeah. You're fairly similar. Right. That's not different. They were not different from one another. But if you look at the older adults, the Chinese older adults are actually in positive territory, whereas these two groups in, in, in the US had negative perform. In other words, they performed the worst. The hearing ones performed absolutely the worst. And so what she's saying is that at least among older adults, if they believe that they are, you know, aging is miserable, they're going to do poorly even on something like memory. It's not just about how they think, it's how they perform well. do you as think well. if they felt positive about themselves and everything, they would have been similar to that's, that's what she would, that's, that's what, what she, she would, would, would predict, absolutely. And chances are that things are changing in China, right? Uh, you know, in the, lots of change now. And if you were to do this research 20 years from now, if negative attitudes about older adults now become common in, in China, or positive attitudes become common in the US, you may not see this difference. But that will we'll just have to, you'll have to come back in 20 years. <laughs> and then I can tell you. Why don't we? Um, if you remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about 2.30. Uh, Should we take a short break, uh, Sherry? Or do you want to take a short break, or we, can we keep going? OK. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so you know, I'm actually going to um, go through this a little bit quickly because I want to get to how we can achieve successful aging. But one thing I do want to point out is that when she looked at the relationship, Carolyn, this will apply to what you are saying. Um, for older adults, when she looked at the relationship between attitude towards aging and memory, she found a positive relationship. In other words, if you were more positive in your views about aging, regardless of your culture now, you, you perform better. So even older adults in the US perform better if they had a more positive view about aging. That speaks exactly to what you're speaking uh, of. And this is consistent with what she'd expect. For younger adults, oddly enough, and she didn't really doesn't know what to make of it, 
is that the more negative their view about aging, the better they did. Which made <laughs> and, <laughs> and she really had a very hard time. They better win. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was weird. Uh, so she she really was a little bit confused about that. It was almost like they were distancing themselves from aging, you know. And so uh, if you really thought that this, you know, aging is all bad, and I'm not going to be like that, they actually did better. So why that may be, we don't know. But these are just relationships that she found. Okay. Something that I do want to talk about is this idea about. Plasticity. So how can we age successfully? The key they found. <laughs> no, not, no Botox. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean plastic surgery. Or <laughs> uh, but it, it's this notion of plasticity. What is plastic? Do you remember from earlier? What do we mean by plastic? Malleable, modifiable, exactly. And um, Bonnie Pruden was a rock climber back in the 30s and 40s, and she has said, you cannot turn back the clock, but heck, you can wind it up again. You know, and this idea that you can relearn. What I do want to point out is, is uh, and I'm going to do this quickly, just so that we can get to the, the last part of the lecture, but there are different types of plasticity. And the one that's gotten the most attention has to do with the plasticity of the brain, neurological plasticity. And it's the most widely studied among them. It refers to our reserve capacity, this idea that how resilient are we? How resilient is the brain from wear and tear, from damage, from aging? How resilient is our brain? And a lot of research is being done here. And what they're finding is that education is a great way to pump up plasticity to pump up our reserve. You can think about reserve as having really a whole bunch of resources that stay with you as long as possible. That's the idea of having this reserve. And what they found is that if you make the right kind of lifestyle choices, exercise, for example, eating right, you are going to have more cognitive reserve. And why does it matter? The beauty of cognitive reserve is that even if you have physiological decline, so let's say you have a brain that is beginning to develop physical signs of Alzheimer's, if you have high cognitive reserve you are, or, or high plasticity, you will not show signs of dementia relative to someone who has low reserve. That is the beauty of it. There, I don't know if you're familiar with the NUN study. Are you familiar with the NUN study? This is being done in, in Minnesota. And what they did was they had a, a group of nuns who had the same lifestyle, same education, really highly educated. And these uh, women had lived a, pretty much a routine life, a very regimented life. And so they were a great group to study. <coughs> and what they found was that there were nuns. And these nuns, actually, many of them donated their brains um, to, to research. So after they died, autopsies were performed. And they actually found that the more highly educated the nun was, the less likely she was to show clinical signs of dementia, so forgetful. The typical things we think about in terms of Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementias. Even though her brain may have had signs of Alzheimer's. So it had physiological, like plaques, yes, absolutely, and tangles, they were in there. But clinically, the women didn't show those. So, to, so they, the, it the absolutely condition. offset. The, the, and so the, the important thing about plasticity is that you may have the physical decline in, in your body, but you don't, because of your reserve, it offsets that. It, you know, it actually buffers that. It, it, it can, you can manage to conceal that or mask that in a good way. And so that is, it, that is a really important element of successful aging. And the, <coughs> education is, is something we can all be provided with, or at least have access to, hopefully. That's why we're here. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's the beauty, that you can actually, ha you, you can fix it. You can build your reserve. It's not some finite little thing that you're born with, and then, you know, it's not like our genes. This is something we can actually pump up. How and do you pump up the brain capacity? By, do, by staying engaged, education, absolutely, and having a, a physically active 
lifestyle. In fact, there is a nun that they talk about in the nun study who started walking daily at the age of 70. And she lived really long. And when at, on death, when they performed an autopsy, they did not find. They were really actually surprised because they did not find an intact brain. They found a brain with lots of different elements showing that this woman should have shown signs of Alzheimer's. But she didn't. And that's the marvel of it. So, so you know, it, it, to me, and, and I, I know my students laugh because I get so excited by, by this information because it's, it's, it's in our hands. That's the beauty of it. It's well, not I, sort of. I, I haven't seen this written up, you know, like in the press. Oh, it was. It was. And actually, there's a, there's a, there's a wonderful book. If you look up uh, the Nun study, it is uh, by a psychologist by the name of Snowden. About how long ago was that published? Um, his most recent book, which is sort of a very accessible book, it's more, uh, like popular book, was published just uh, within the last five years. But this research has been going on for you know almost twelve years, fifteen years. So, and he's been following these women. Um, oh, the nun study. The nun study. N U N. Yeah, and, and they were really uh, nuns that he followed, and so it's a. It's a lovely book uh, to read, and it's, uh, you know, it, it shows you how um, reserve capacity can take you very far. So if you can uh, uh, you know, get your hands on it, uh, I definitely recommend it. There are other forms of plasticity. They've really received less attention. You have behavioral plasticity, the idea that you, know, you have to have the capacity to adapt and to learn. But right now, the focus is on neurological uh, reserve capacity. Helen. The big thing they've been writing up the last couple of years that I've been reading about brain cells, they can regenerate yes. in older people. And Absolutely. they never thought that would be. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the, the beauty of, of this field, that things are constantly changing. Because 10 years ago, we believed that you had all the neurons that you did when you were born. Yeah. And that if they were damaged, they were damaged for good. Now we know that they can be regenerated, you know, it's just, it's marvelous what this could mean for, for all of us as we look ahead. So you have behavioral plasticity, this idea that, you know, you, you, you have some capacity to adapt and to learn from, from an environment that's changing. If you think about, it's my old internet question, right? We do have behavioral capacity, a, a reserve capacity, and we can learn new things in a changing environment. And societal Plasticity, this idea that as a society we need to change. We need to look at aging and our older adults differently. And if we do that, we'll act, we, can, we, we can control this too. And we can, in a way, make for a more positive aging experience for all of us. Not just for, you know, and not just into the future. If we start now, we can actually change it right now. Oh, I have no idea why this is doing this. But we'll let it. <laughs> So, mm -hmm. sure, sure. About the nun study, and I'm not being sarcastic when I'm asking uh -huh. this question. Could it be that they were more successful at aging because they didn't have to deal with a spouse <laughs> and children? Oh, no, no, no. That's a very important, it's an important point because, Sherry, the, 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 the if you look at it, not all nuns aged successfully, okay. right? So, and, and the beauty about this, this group is that none of them was married. So you could rule marriage out. None of them had children. So you could rule children out as contributing to this. So it was, in that sense, a fairly pure group to look at. Now, can you generalize how many of us have those kinds of lives? Not many of us, you know? And so, so there are issues. But given if you're looking at only this group, the idea that even in terms of sexual behavior. They had the same background, right? No sexual uh, behavior either. And so you had a, a group that was very interesting to look at because they were so uniform, in a sense. And you still found variability. You still found that there were some nuns who aged beautifully and others who just you know, went under. In fact, David Snowden in his book talks about how when he first came out with the finding that education is key, some of the nuns actually got very upset because if their education, you know, they were now in their 70s. They had no control over their education. 
And they felt that, wow, this is like a sentence, like a life sentence, that if I ha don't have a good education, then it's all over for me, especially the, w the nuns who were in their 60s. They thought their future was really bleak. And he had to be very careful, and he kept saying, look, it's only one factor. But yes, other things being equal, the more highly educated you are, the higher your cognitive reserve, the more likely you are to age successfully. So, you know, it, he, he and the book is beautiful because he talks about how some of the nuns felt, you know, shortchanged by life in a sense, and it was too late for them to do anything. Yes? Well, uh, how about the, the element of uh, emotional plasticity, all right, where, uh, and the notion of people uh, coping with loss, mm -hmm. particularly uh, like loss of a spat. Well, as you age, of course, you're, right. you're going to lose your parents. Sure. Sure. And uh, loss of spouse, possibly loss of children, and uh, the effect that that has on older people in perhaps causing depression mm -hmm. or losing that uh, positive outlook on life that contributes to. So is there, is there any studies been done on emotional plasticity that would fit that? There's a lot, and actually it's, it's, it's <coughs> wonderful that you're asking this because we'll talk about this tomorrow. But they don't really, they don't frame it as plasticity, but they talk about emotional regulation. How do we regulate our emotions so that we can feel the more positive and minimize the negative? And the idea is that the more you can, the better you can regulate your emotions to feel positive versus negative, the, the less likely you are to have depression and the more successful your aging is. But we will definitely talk about it, the emotional aspects of aging uh, tomorrow. Um, it, it brings up a good point in terms of one of the variables that's sort of lurking in the background there, but depression is an issue mm -hmm. um, and it's not, I mean, it can be age related, but it is also depression is, we're becoming, learning more and more about it as being a, a uh, a physiological uh, absolutely yeah. and, absolutely and, 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 and that, fixable yeah. you know very, very fixable how does that affect the analysis that we're, we're talking about here um, we'll talk a little bit about emotions and mental health tomorrow but okay. depression clinical depression if you think about clinical depression if you just look at the numbers it actually becomes less prevalent in late life really? yes mild symptoms of depression tend to be higher so just feeling a little bit blue and, you know, not just, you know, not feeling positive, but sort of the uh, soaking depression, you know, the unipolar, the, the clinical depression. The, the, the rates are much lower among older adults than they are. It's most common in the 30s, is, is it not? The, the uh, it's it's actually common um, pretty much actually through the lifespan and much more common among women than men. But clinical depression, uh, middle age is, is not unusual, you know, <coughs> to see a spike in, in rates of uh, depression. But in late life, and actually that goes against conventional wisdom, because you tend to think, oh, you know, depression is part and parcel of being old. And actually, the, the folks at UPenn were among the first about 20 years ago to try to dispel that myth that being old is equivalent to being depressed, because most older adults, yes, a good chunk of them do have it, but it's very fixable. You put people on, on medication and it really works. They don't have to wallow right. in feeling miserable. I know a lot of people that are on it and nursing home patients even. Absolutely. Do Absolutely. Maybe it's part of that atmosphere that they're in. That yes, yes. So, so uh, you know, mild uh, feelings of blueness are common, but clinical depression is less uh, common. Um, so, how do we achieve? successful aging, right? We've talked about it. I have to tell you how you do it. Uh, um, Baltus and Baltus, this is the same Paul Baltus, and his uh, wife, Margaret Baltus, who died a few, uh, about three years before he did, developed the SOC model, the SOC model. Okay, and we'll talk about that. And then actually, Richard Schulz is my uh, dissertation advisor in, uh, at uh, Pitt, and he actually developed with Heckhausen um, the lifespan theory of control, and we'll talk about that. And then there is Carolyn Aldwin, who developed this idea of a deviation amplification model. It's a mouthful, but what she's really saying is interesting about how we can learn to cope with challenges as we get older. And so we'll talk about each of these, I'm hoping, um, in 10 minutes. If not, we'll just talk about the SOC model because it really speaks to all the others. But the idea, what Baltus and Baltus said is, look, let's not kid ourselves. There are losses, right? We, 
as we get older, we do lose certain capacity. So we, we don't want to sort of have a Pollyanna-ish kind of view that, oh, India, yeah, everything's glorious. No. The truth is there are losses. There is decline. So what they said was that you need three things. You need to do three things. You need to select. Then for, that's the S. You need to optimize. And then you need to compensate. If you can engage in selection, optimization, and compensation, you're well on your way to successful aging. So what do they mean by that? What they said was, look, losses are inevitable. You are going to have losses as you get older. But what is important then is to select and focus on things that really matter to you. So if, for example, among all the things that you used to do when you were younger, there were some that are really important to you, let's say traveling is very, very important to you, you make sure that you select that. So you, you, you give up some of the less valuable activities, and you, you retain those that you're going to focus on, that you're going to select or specialize in. Once you do that, so you select out from, from a host of things that you used to do, and you only do a few things that are most valuable, you optimize. You make sure that you channel all your resources toward that particular, or toward those few selected activities. <coughs> so you love to, cha uh, to travel, so you make sure that you leave financial resources available to allow you to travel, because you really want to do that. And you like to drive everywhere, and so you get in the car, and, or you have your you know, uh, motor home, and you get in it, and you go. And then you learn to compensate. So after a while, you cannot drive. It's too stressful. Perhaps you will take guided tours. You'll join a group or a troop or a tour bus. Get on it and continue to do, to do the things that really matter to you. It could be the same with reading. You love to read. Among all the things that you do, you want to retain reading. So you make sure you select that out. That's where you're going to really focus your time and energies on reading. You optimize the availability of books. You make sure you go to the community library or the bookmobile comes by your home. And a lot of communities will have their librarians send books to you if you're an older adult just to give you access to those. And you make sure you optimize those. And then you find that you're not able to read as well as you used to. So you go to audiobooks or you, you use large print books, but you, you, you compensate for losses. And if you, what, what they say is if you can do this dance, in terms of selecting, optimizing, compensating. Ooh, another loss. I'm going to select. I'm going to optimize. I'm going to compensate. You are well on your way to age successfully. It's a model, actually, that, that in some ways is the foundation of every other <coughs> model in gerontology. So it is the, the mother of all models, if you will. Uh, you know, it, it really is, forms the backbone of all other models. I won't go into the other two because we don't have time. But I do want to just share with you and I'm not going to recap. I know that we're out of time. I want to give you some time for, <laughs> for questions. I had to end with Josh Burns, of course, who said, you can't help getting older, but you don't have to get old. And a favorite of mine oops, is Betty Davis. <laughs> George Burns once, he went to his doctor, and the doctor was, or they asked him, they said, well, what, what do your doctors tell you about having a cigar every day? He goes, all my doctors are dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's classic. That's absolutely classic. I, you know, rather than doing any more, I, I wanted to open it up. Are there any thoughts, questions? Um, yes? What other book? Uh, would you recommend besides the good study? Um, the there, there's a book by Rowan Kahn called Successful Aging. That is a very readable book. Uh, uh, Rowan Kahn, they're um, the, same, the same folks who. And their book is called Successful Aging, and that's definitely worthwhile. We're in, in an area where there are a lot of uh, retirement homes. People in our in our particular area and the adjoining area decided they don't want to move to these retirement communities. So but they have set up what they call a village, and we have our own paper, 
Uh, we do different things for people that might need some help temporarily, like maybe walking their dog or watering their plants or watching the house while they're yeah. traveling, that yeah. type of thing. And it's becoming very successful, and it's a model for other areas. Wait, now where is this? Uh, we're in Bethesda, outside of Walker. Sure. Okay. It started, started in Silver Spring. Mm -hmm. Okay. Copies yeah, it. so it's really a support system that's been built. That's that's great, and you don't have to leave your home. Within the community, by the community. Sure, sure. It's called the village. It's called the village. I'm going to look it up. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? Yes. Oh, well, no, I read in the AARP journal this week. Just I might have told some people that uh, there was a 76-year-old retired theater professor. And he took eight, eight years to do it, but he memorized all 10,565 lines of Milton's Paradise Lost. That'll do it. <laughs> Since then, he has recited it in three eight-hour days. Twice he did this. Wow, that's successful aging for you. Dorothy, you had a question or, or a comment. I was just going to say, who wants to hang out with that guy? <laughs> One moment, Dorothy is speaking. Um, yeah. I've had that much. elder law for a while, and I had a client in my office one day, and um, one of my colleagues handed me that Betty Davis's comment on a, a sheet of paper, and so I, to be polite, I showed it to my client, and he must have been late 70s or early 80s. He was very, very offended. Really? Yeah, I was shocked. Why was he offended? Do you I know? I don't know. He just was very upset. My problem in getting older is forgetting names. I know the face, I know the person, but the names slip by. Do you have any suggestion on how to improve my memory? You still know yours. Practice. I would say practice. Yeah, so, you know, go. Uh, it's difficult. I mean, there is something known as a tip of the tongue phenomenon, right? And you probably think, oh, I almost know it. I recognize the face. I know this person, and it j it's just it, that the the information is is not it's not accessible to you at that moment. You may even remember the name later after you've passed. Uh, and so, so, you know, the, some of that is normal aging. It's what happens to all of us. So I would say practice names, you know, pictures, look at photographs and, and see if you can recognize names and, you know, say the names of individuals. Like a lot of people do that with their high school uh, book, you know, their yearbooks and things like that, just to see if they can. But there's no, there's practice is all I can say. Any other Thoughts? I will see you tomorrow morning at 10.15, and we'll talk about relationships and health as we get older. Thank you so much.